Okay. Hello, everybody. Can you hear me well? We are starting. I don't know if we can uh, raise the volume somewhere. I have to figure this out. How about now? No, I'll figure it out. But you guys can hear me, right? Especially in the back. Okay, so I'll put that here. So welcome to Food Analysis. Uh, today, I'll just do some introduction to the course overall, some updates, and we might have some time to do overall introduction to food analysis in general as a topic. Um, well, I'm Kiel Ishmael. I am here as a professor since 2007. So this is my 15th year of teaching this class. So this is one of the things I love the most is teaching undergrads. And I love this class, and I hope by the end of the semester, you're going to say something in this class. So um, so what I have here is a slide that walks you through, um, you know, navigating the canvas, certain topics you want to talk about, and a little bit of adjustments for this particular semester. Um, so in terms of handouts, um, we don't give you like practical handouts. Everything is on Canvas, but also a cap put together for you, um, a lecture packet. So this is available at the student center, uh, but it's optional. So what you find in this uh, packet is your syllabus, your student learning outcomes, your schedule, um, and then you have all the lectures as well print it out for you. So you can buy it for your convenience, or if you don't want to buy it, you're not going to fall behind because there's everything on Canvas. So, and I will introduce the Canvas site. Um, you probably had a chance to look at it already. And if you didn't have to, I'll just tell you what were the important things on Canvas. So this is just the uh, home page, but you might want to pay attention to three important locations. So one is the modules location. Let me see where is my mouse. Where's my mouse? Oh, there it is. So if you go to modules, you will find everything you need for the class. So here you have a folder that where you're finding your syllabus the schedule, and the student learning outcomes. I'll walk you through them, but I definitely encourage you to look at the syllabus carefully. It has a lot of information. I will not go through it all in class. And then we go back um, to modules, other important folders. So you have lab information. So here you'll find lab information we'll talk about them more in detail during the first lab session next week so there are going to be lab reports in this class so this is a lab report format document you're going to be citing references so this is the document that shows you this the reference style and then these are a safety um, guideline document sources of laboratory error MSDS sheet, and how to prepare tables and figures correctly. So this is a very resourceful folder for you related to the lab. Then we go back to modules. Here you also have um, sample quizzes and exams. All the quizzes and exams I gave last year are posted here. So whenever there is a quiz, after you study, you go in here, and you'll find the quiz without the key, and then you find the key. I encourage you to try to solve after you study. Don't open the key and try to study. You won't get the same questions, obviously. 
But if you studied and answered the, key, the, the quiz correctly, then you're ready for the quiz, okay? But don't look at the key before you attempt to solve the quiz. This is part of how you wanna study as well. It's one of the resources that you have to study for the class. Okay, and then we go back to modules. And then uh, here you have textbook study questions. So you have a textbook for this class. This is your textbook. And you really need the fifth edition. Do not get the fourth or the third or the second or whatever. You need the fifth edition because that's the most updated and I followed that in my lectures. And it's very useful to have this book when you go, even if you go to industry and you don't go to grad school, this is going to be kind of a resource for you even during your work. I have a lot of students that went to industry and said, we open put analysis book quite often. So it's good to have, but you can access it through the library online. As a student, you can go in and have access to it if you don't want to purchase it. I encourage purchasing because that's a resource, but you don't have to. Um, you can ask them that one. Now, you need a lab manual, and I strongly recommend that you buy your own copy. We will use it several times during labs. Some of the labs we give you outside addendums, but the first lab, for example, next week, you need your lab manual. So make sure you have one prior to the lab, or at least this week, because you will need, need it for the free lab course. And in the book, there are questions after each chapter. So I have these study questions here. So when you study, you can test your knowledge by going to that. If you need the key, I have the key in my office. So you just have to, to ask me and I'll share with you answer. The editor of the book did not want us, the instructors, to share the key openly with the students. but. If you need a key for a particular question, I can show it to you. Okay, and then um, there is a folder that is important, is the sample lab reports. It's empty right now, you don't find sample lab reports, but next week in lab, I will show you physically a report on nutrition labeling. That would be your first lab report. I will show it to you, but I won't post it here, obviously. Once you turn in your lab report and they get graded, we put an example lab report that you can use as a guide for the next lab report submission. So here, every week, we will post a lab report example that will help you. As a reminder, this is a writing intensive class, and we use lab reports to grade every week and help you improve your writing in each of the, the upcoming lab reports. Okay. And then, for every lab report, there are a set of questions. And these questions are usually used. Sometimes I get the same question in a quiz or similar questions in exam. So after we grade your lab report, I post the key so that you have the key to study from for your quiz or exam. Again, another very useful resource. Now. The last folder here, which I will populate every time I, we grade your quiz or exam, we post the key so that you can look at your grade, you can look at the key, and if there's any discrepancy, you have any questions, you can talk to me in case we do a mistake in grading. So you can definitely go back to the key and use it as a resource. Now, these on top are your informational folders, but then here, you will see lecture material every week. I will open it probably around Wednesday uh, through Friday. If I forget, make sure to remind me, that's okay to send me an email, say, hey, Pam, you forgot to put lecture material and I will do so and make sure that they're available to you. And like I said, they are in your lecture packet, but if you don't wanna buy one, you will find them here. So this week we'll have two lectures and they are already uh, posted for you. Now, um, the other thing that you will see in every week, under every week, this is first week, um, you will see a recording. I re I'm recording the lecture. These are from last year. I have them as backup, but currently as a student, you can't see them. 
uh, but I will post my new one from to, from this year. So you will see for the analysis recorded lecture one, September 7, 2022, it will be posted here for you. Uh, the recording is not in lieu of attendance. I encourage you to attend, but you're adults. You can do whatever you want, but attendance is recommended because there are participation points. So during the lecture, I'll ask questions, you will answer questions, all of that is plus two. Even if you said yes or no, that will come towards participation. So please feel uh, free to participate, don't be shy. There is no question that I consider is as invalid, every question is valid. I appreciate your questions and your participation and you get rewarded for that. Um, and then another important folder is lab material. So here it's not yet open for you. By Wednesday or Thursday, we'll have this open for next week. So you will see uh, the lab presentation that we will be giving in lab, the general intro that I would give, and then a sheet that you would need uh, for the lab, plus a grading guide, which will be added. This is new this year. So this is material from last year. We will edit and put the new material and then publish, and then you will find it available for you. Um, so this is, this is modules. Sometimes I have um, extra credit homework. You'll find it posted here. So everything you need per week, you will find uh, posted for you. Now, another important, uh, part is assignment. So pre-lab quizzes will be put as an assignment for you and they will open either Wednesday or Thursday um, of the week for the following Monday or Wednesday lab. If you're a Wednesday lab, you do the pre-lab quiz and submit before 9 a.m. that day. If you're a Monday lab, you also work on it and submit it before 9 a.m. that day. Um, so you will get reminders and you will get notification when there is an assignment set for you. Uh, the other one that is important is media gallery. So the media gallery, I don't know if there's anything posted yet, but every week there is a video for the lab. So we, we want you to watch the video before you come to the lab. So you will find in the gallery, you will find the video for next week's lab. And then what you need to do, you need to have a lab notebook and that you will bring with you. Now you will ask me what kind of lab notebook, any lab notebook, I mean, not a small diary book, but a, you know, a notebook that you can use in the lab. And the first thing you wanna put in your lab notebook is notes you've taken from the video. This tells us that you watch the video before coming to the lab. Why is that important? Because you come, you know what you need to do. Just reading the manual might not help you, but when you see, then you will be very familiar with, with, with what you need to do, and then the lab goes smoothly. And then you take notes to help you remember uh, the different steps that you will be doing in the lab. Uh, lab notebooks will be checked every time you come to the lab, the TA, or the lab coordinator will check the lab notebook to make sure that you took notes from the video. Okay, uh, so this is, the, this is the Canvas website. If you have any question in, in terms of navigating um, the website, please let us know. If you can find anything, or is it not visible? It should be visible and not visible. Please don't be shy to uh, let us know. So I want to introduce our lab coordinator, Kat Clemmer in the back. Kat will be the main person in the lab. She's gonna lead all lab sessions for you. And she will be, and they will be working closely with the TAs. So the TAs that we have, we have Jean Go. Jean was a student in this class two years ago during COVID, right? 2020. <laughs> and then we have um, Hush. I used my students for two years, by the way. I just went blank. I was going to call him Mycin again. 
Um, so Nigel is a returning TA. Um, you will see him in several labs as well as a new TA. And our newest TA is uh, Brittany. Brittany Krug is also a student that was in this class um, last year. So all are knowledgeable, you're in good hands, um, very, very capable lab coordinator and team. Uh, now, I mentioned the textbook and the lab manual and the course packet, and it's a writing intensive, so there is a lab report every week. I'll talk about that in lab. Um, I want to show you uh, quickly the syllabus. Um, let's see here. Okay. Probably can move it to here. Okay, so we already introduced the lab coordinator, teaching assistants. Um, Please do read. I'm not going to go through all of this with you now. I'll, whatever is lab related, I'll mention it next week. But the course objectives, the student learning outcomes for the class, the different topics of the class, the different laboratory sessions that you have, and the writing intensive. So you will be graded for writing, given this is the rule and regulations for writing intensive classes. but we have help on campus. You are you will be given sufficient time to turn in like your lab reports. And if any of you uh, feel that you need help with sentence structure, with grammar, uh, with overall writing, there is the writing center. They actually give appointments and they can review six pages at a time. And the lab report is not gonna be more than five pages, about double space and some of it mostly figures and tables. So uh, you will be able to get half an hour appointment to review your writing. Uh, these are the different points. There are multiple opportunities to earn points in this class. So it's not a midterm and a final, fail one and you fail the class. No, you would have multiple opportunities. We have two quizzes, one on a Monday and one on a Wednesday, just to distribute for those people that have lab on Monday and, and lab on Wednesday, so the quizzes are not always on the same day. Um, the midterm is on a Friday, so we mix it up a little bit. And then we have a two hour final, and these are the dates. Um, we have lab reports. If you see the lab reports that are 280 points, so they are about a little over one third of the class Points. So if you do well in lab report, you're going to do well in the class overall. So that's a big portion of pre-lab quizzes. So pre-lab quizzes are very short question number, question three to four questions every week that you take prior to the lab to ensure that you know what the lab is about. So it's 50 points. Your laboratory notebook is 50 points. And then participation, involvement, attendance is, is 50 points. So you, you earn points for being um, in the class and involved with the class. So there are a little bit more detail on each of these um, graded uh, portions, quizzes in the exam, the lab report. We'll talk more in very much next week about it. Uh, participation, so every participation is worth two points, and we have extra credit opportunities. So once I know everybody in the class and I like to learn names and know you all, I might walk in one day and I say everybody in the class today is going to get 10 points, extra credit. So just random. And I do assign a uh, homework, but for extra credit. So you're not, you don't need to do the homework. It's not part of your main grad credit, but if you do it, you get extra credit and it helps you learn the material. So I will assign those extra credit. And sometimes during class, I tell you to pick up a piece of paper and try to solve certain questions. And then you hand me that piece of paper with your name on it and you get extra credit for that. Um, just to keep you a little bit engaged and to learn the material and not to be 
like me right now talking and you just listening. So I try to make it more engaged. Um, okay, this is the letter distribution. It's very, very typical um, to any other undergraduate class. So I want to show you um, the student learning outcome document. So this is also uh, on Canvas. Uh, this is document is basically kind of your study guide. For every topic, uh, there are uh, certain things that you need to check. After you study, do you understand the importance of good analysis and quality control and management, research, and development? So from the lecture notes, do you feel like you can answer this? So this is basically after you study, you go through this for every section, for every chapter, there will be uh, some guidance to what you need to know and whether or not you know the material. So use that as your study guide. You have, this is as a tool, you have previous quizzes and exam as a tool, you have the questions I ask in class as a tool, you have the extra credit homework as a tool to make sure that you know the material. Okay, <clears throat> now I want to just quickly talk about um, schedule and adjustments for this semester. Okay, so this is the schedule that we normally follow and it tells you the topic and who's the instructor. I had to shift a few things around. I do have a medical procedure that is coming up. So we moved up uh, the gas chromatography lectures by Dr. Gary Nexus will be moved up to 26 and 28. And then there are a um, couple of lectures that I highlighted in yellow. I will be undergoing a medical treatment and I won't be able to give the lecture. So somebody else will be giving us these lectures and I will announce that as soon as I figure out who, who your guest lectures are. Starting October um, 14, I will be teaching from home. I won't be able physically to be here. So I will be teaching from home. And what will happen is we will try to make sure that you all come to class and I can be on Zoom with the camera projected and I will be just teaching you from the camera somewhere. And, um, and then you just come here. If, there, if we have any technical issues, we will have you be somewhere and attend the lecture online. So I will keep you updated. Uh, we will test the technology to see if I'll be able to present and you will able to see me if you are in the class. So these are the, the new situation for this particular semester. Um, but I'll keep you informed. I'll keep you updated uh, with everything. Every Friday, you'll get an email from me that will introduce you to what's happening the week after so that you keep you stay informed and you know what's going on. Okay, so let's go back here. All right. So we'll talk about lab in lab. And I think I covered that you think the one thing that we would all be happy about is there used to be a semester long project, which is no longer, it's been no longer for a couple of years now. Um, the project would walk you through, if you work in a company and you are in charge of quality assessment, analytical quality assessment, you would test raw material, you would have measurements during uh, the production of, an, of a product, and then you would do analytical testing on the final product. So the semester-long project was each student would pick a product and will uh, put together what goes in terms of assessment from raw ingredient to the end product. So it kind of enforces everything we learn in class, but students over the years found it too much work, 
it's a four credit class, not five credit class. So I got convinced to eliminate it, but I still believe that it was a really good learning tool. So I put a project example on Canvas under week one. For curiosity, if you want, with your own time, you can go have a look at what was that project about. But lucky you, it's no longer a requirement. <clears throat> okay, speaking about this course in general, let's see what you have heard about this class. Did you hear that it was hard class? Yes or no? Yes, Kevin. Silently nodding. So is it a hard class? Do you all agree that you heard it was hard class? Ah, okay, okay. So it wasn't, nobody said it was easy? Mm -hmm. Why are you here? <laughs> Up for the chance. Is it haunting? Does it give you nightmares at night? What? What were you gonna say? Say your name. Uh, yes, Braden, you're gonna get plus two for this. <laughs> if I say the class is haunting, I'll get a plus two for this. Yes. All right. All right. <laughs> we all think it's haunty, it's haunty, it's haunty, it's haunty, it's just haunting, but in a good way. Okay. <laughs> Is it challenging? Oh, we're going to challenge you really hard. <laughs> but again, in a good way. Okay. Is it boring? Now, if you say yes, that's a minus two. <laughs> from now, from the beginning. Well, to honestly, not everybody likes analysis. So it's not boring for me, but it might be boring topic for some of you. But I really wanna work hard as much as I can this semester in particular um, to, to make it engaging and to, you know, at the end of it say, oh, I, you know, I might use this information. Uh, interesting for me, 100%. Again, for all of you, Maybe 50. Useless? Don't you dare. <laughs> no, it's not. I can promise you it's not going to be a useless uh, class. We learn a lot of different topics, a broad range of topics. I'll give you a lot of examples that are applicable in industry. I will for sure promise that it's going to be useful for you. Okay. So, participation opportunity begins. Um, and you can just raise your hand, say your name, because the PAs are learning your names as well. So, let's see here. Food analysis, include chemical analysis and characterization of food components, physical analysis of food, microbiological analysis, sensory analysis. Don't be shy, wrong answer is okay. You were, yeah, Rotrish? Yes. All of the above. What's that? I didn't hear that second part. So you were saying like the uh, option has all of the above. Oh, you don't know me. <laughs> you actually don't know me at all. No, sometimes I will trick you. But it is all of <laughs> In this particular case, it is all of the above. Anything related to analysis of food, even though sensory is not going to be covered in this class, but it's sensory regulation of food. Uh, microbiological analysis is in this class, but it's also under analysis of food. Physical analysis, looking at viscosity, for example, or meteorology. Um, these are physical color. This is physical analysis of food. A is what we're going to focus on in this class. So this class is going to focus on chemical analysis and characteristics of the components, which is the one element of the entire book analysis. And it's actually, the book has um, a section on physical analysis, for example, but we don't cover this in this class. 
Food composition analysis is carried out. What is food composition? Let's define food composition first, and then we can answer the question. When you hear food composition, what does that mean to you? Any What is in the product? What, what is made up of? Example. <clears throat> Give me one example of, of that can um, be the product. Maybe you have cereal, and you have a list of what is made up of ingredients. Mm. Okay, ingredients is, is correct, but even ingredients have composition. Go ahead and say your name for Carol Ross. Um, I would say like the moisture, temperature. Yes, exactly. The components that make up the food. You had your hand up the shirt with a human on it. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think we know like what Carol says, like a blueberry will have like carbohydrates, they'll have sugars, and like they'll have what make up a food. Absolutely. So we have, we're going to learn something in this class called proximate analysis. When you hear the word proximate analysis, we're talking about five main components, protein, carbohydrate, fat, water, and ash, minerals. But there are other components in food. Vitamins is in food, but it's not part of proximate analysis. You have phytochemicals in food, and it's not part of proximate analysis. So any macro, micro components of the food or the food ingredient, we do food composition of. Okay, so now that we know what composition analysis is, so why do we carry composition analysis out of all of this? Yes, you are laughing. Do you want to give the most common answer? I'm going to go with what this man said. I, I think it's all the above. Yes, and say your name. Oh, yeah. Ash. Yes. Gosh, I should have put some none of the above. <laughs> <laughs> okay, maybe the next question. Yes, we're going to learn about, from a consumer perspective, what do they care for? Low fat. So we need to measure the amount of fat in the food so that we can put on the label low fat or zero fat. Um, the consumer is looking for reduced salt, for example. The consumer now is looking for high protein, more business for me. So we look at, to me, consumers demand that's a great, uh, great reason for the competition. To me, government requirement. We have standard of identity. For example, milk has standard of identity, cheese has a standard of identity, whole flour has a standard of identity, and the standard of identity tells you uh, for a particular component what the percentage should be. Like if you want to claim low fat milk, it should have 2% fat, no more than 2% fat. So government uh, has certain requirements and we use the composition analysis to meet the government requirement to determine nutritional benefits. So I want to know if I'm taking enough uh, protein in my diet or enough fiber in my diet. There are certain guidelines per day in terms of consumption of protein, consumption even of fat, carbohydrate. So um, we need to look at nutritional benefits for, for quality control. So we do composition analysis that say moisture content. If, if a product supposedly should have like wheat or grain should have 10 to 13% moisture, and if they have 15% moisture, they're gonna mold over time during storage. So we need to make sure that certain components are at specific range or percentage to maintain a certain quality. So why do we need to analyze food from a consumer perspective? So basically, quality, the consumer cares for quality. So they wanna make sure that what they are consuming is of high quality and consistent quality. So if I go buy, let's say a cereal box today and it tasted certain way, it has a certain crunch, it has certain element to it, and then I go buy it next week and it's completely different. That's going to bug me, not right? I, I want consistent quality. I want good quality. So we need to analyze to ensure that. Safety. 
again, consumer cares, cares for safety. You don't want any toxicity. So we'll have a whole chapter on contaminants of concerns. So other than microbes, there are chemical contaminants of concern. So we're going to learn about what other chemicals we need to watch out for and prevent their presence in our food. Nutrition and health. Okay, calcium and osteoporosis, for example. So there are certain claims that the companies can put on the container, uh, high fiber um, and high fiber and digestion health, for example. So high protein, muscle building. So there are the consumer care for certain components for particular health reasons. Okay, here's an example of a health claim. Mm -hmm. We have all of the above options. Mm -hmm. A health claim related to coronary heart disease may involve the analysis of the following. Say your name, please. Priyanshi. Priyanshi. A and C. A and C. So it's not all of the above? Okay, hold that thought. Say your name, Jason. please. Jason. I would say it's probably it's all of the above. Because I mean you can also use fiber to work with sex claims for health benefits, even though it's not nutrients. There's a good reason. Any other answer? What do you say? Yeah. No. No. <laughs> Sorry, you can't say it. <laughs> you have to say. I'd say that I agree with uh the last uh the last all of that one. Hold up. Say your name again. Yes. I think A and B. A and C. Anyone before A and B? You. Me? Yes. <laughs> Do I get plus two? <laughs> okay, so it's A and B. And I'll explain why. So saturated fat is not good for the arteries, um, you know, the veins can have a build up. It's going to be not good for heart disease. Um, Phytochemicals actually have a positive impact on uh, heart disease. They act as antioxidants. Free fatty acids have nothing to do with free fatty acids. We care for them if we're looking at shelf life stability of organs. If we're looking at shelf life stability of a grain or a flower. Uh, the higher amount of free fatty acids we have, the higher probability of liver oxidation. So this is not relevant. So in this case, it's A and B. It's not all of the above, that's for sure, and it's not A and C. So we need to analyze food from a food industry perspective. Now, of course, they're going to care for product quality. They want to have good quality with minimum cost. They need consistent quality. So they have to stand out from other competitors. So they aim for product quality, um, consistent, good quality. Product development, I'll give you example later on on product development. So basically uh, they have a product, they always put let's say animal butter butter in it, uh, animal source fat, but they want to reduce cost or for health reasons, they want to remove the butter and put vegetable oil. Um, how would that impact the product? So there will be a question about that later on and what kind of tests they need to do if they want to develop a new product with a different source of fat. That's one example. So the, this is for the reason of consumer demand as well as a cost when they want to uh, reduce their cost. But consumers are demanding new products, new health benefits. They are looking for good quality and consistent quality. So the food industry will have to address that need. Evaluation of new processes. So they always look to enhance their efficiency of production, uh, lower the energy use, 
lower the cost, speed up the production. But every time they change their process, the food will change and they will have to monitor that change and adjust the, the process to maintain good quality, safe product as well as acceptable products. So here, they always consider cost and profit. If they lower energy and they, if they increase time, they enhance their efficiency and reduce cost, which potentially cause higher profit. Solve problems. So I'll give you an example about that. Solving problems, if you are an ingredient company, you're often dealing with solving problems of your customers who are CPG companies. Let's say you are a Cargill company selling to General Mills. A General Mills is producing a cereal using an ingredient that um, Cargill is producing. So they find something off with this ingredient, they go back, uh, with something off with their product, they go back to the source and they go to Cargill and say, something is off with your ingredient. Then they start something we call food forensics. So they start looking at what is going on wrong with their ingredient. Is it their ingredient? Is it their customer processing line? So they start an investigation and I'll give you an example. Um, later on. Compete. Well, that's that's a big, big deal. Um, they, next week, you're going to learn uh, how you generate nutrition label, but you're also going to learn in lab how you do reverse engineering. What does that mean? So there is a product and another company is a competitor and want to produce the same energy bar, high protein bar, or whatever it is. But they see the ingredients on the label, but they don't know how much that they put in to produce that that product. So there is a program that you will be learning next week in lab that will gives you reverse engineering. You enter the ingredient, you enter the nutrition label information, and you back engineer to give you the percentage of the different ingredients that were put into that formula. This is used to compete to produce something similar um, when you don't have the information. No matter what, with industry is bound by government regulation. So testing has to be done under government regulation. The end product needs to have certain specifics based on government regulation. So those of you taking food quality or has taken food quality, you spend quite a bit of time talking about government regulations. So here's a recap. Last year, apparently I stopped here, but today I have three minutes left. Do I? Yes, I do. So we can we can work on this question, earn some participation point, and we can stop here. As a food scientist in the R&D department, so you work at the industry in the uh, research and development department, and you were asked by your management, okay, they want to replace part of my vegetable oil. Example I gave you. And this is could be to reduce cost or maybe to make the product more healthy with less saturated fat and less cholesterol. What food analysis steps will be involved in this process? What would you want to test? Can be any food analysis. All right, uh, you're uh, Tyler, huh? Taylor. Taylor. Um, sensory testing, see if it has like an impact on how food is like. Absolutely. Sensory testing is a big, big part of it. Does the texture change? Does the flavor change? What else? Say your name. Snow. Snow. Yeah. Allergy. Oh, can you elaborate? What would your allergies to some other Well, so you are keeping everything the same. You're removing the butter and you're adding vegetable fat. So allergy in this case is not relevant, but it's okay. It's a good guess. But yeah. Go ahead, tell me your name. Ingrid. 
Ingrid. Uh, yes, thank you very much. Shelf life. Because now you have vegetable oil or fat, it's, it might have unsaturated fatty acids where unsaturated fatty acids are more prone to oxidation. So when you put unsaturated fat in your product, you want to store it over time and then look for oxidation markers. So we will have a whole lab on lipid oxidation where you're going to test oxidation. Go for it. Your name for it. Uh, Ash. Ash, that's right. Sorry, um, I'll, I'll, I'll remember that day. <laughs> Um, you probably have to retest the uh, nutrition label um, to make sure that all of the yes. are the same or possibly updated. Like, uh, for instance, when vegetable fats are in the unsaturated fats in the water will so you can have to take that. Absolutely. On the fat, on the label, the nutrition label, you have cholesterol too. So you might want to reevaluate your fat composition for the label perspective. And we will have a whole chapter on nutrition labeling and you will see what goes in the nutrition label. So that is absolutely correct. So, so far we talked about shelf life, nutrition label, um, sensory evaluation. Is there anything else you can think of? Go for it. I'll take any chemical analysis. I mean, a lot of butter are used in baking and if we want to have like real competitions using vegetable fat as substitute, it has to like have that. Similar chemical structures that don't talk to So the functionality, basically, the structure of food, that's more physical testing. Yes, which is correct. So when you change the component, and then if it's used in baking, the baking characteristics would change depending on the fat composition. Zeta will be very happy with you for saying that. So yes, definitely. So you get the idea, you get the gist. So even if it's one small change, which you think is a small change, it will impact so many different things. Okay, I took 30 seconds more. Thank you, I'll see you on Friday. Oh, thank you. Wow. Wow. <laughs>